Hello, I'm Alan Kohler, founder of Eureka Report, now part of Intelligent Investor, finance presenter on ABC News and columnist for the New Daily. And I'm Stephen Main, contributor, intelligent investor, founder of Crikey, shareholder, advocate and City of Manningham councillor. And, and we, we are, are The Money, Money Cafe. Cafe. And Alan, let's light some fires, as Bruce Lamman said. Let's light what are we going to talk about? Sydney, well, it's, it's all on happening, fire. It's, it's in, unbelievable. It's all happening in Sydney. We're in uh, calm, calm Melbourne uh, where nothing's happening. But, uh, we don't boy, have a oh, terror, it's no terrorist attack being declared. I mean, that that's was, obviously developing overnight, the... the, the, the Syrian Tell us a bit about. Being uh, you're, you're a bit of an expert on the Westfield shopping centres. Um, just, I mean, we don't have much to say about the the incident, or the terrible incident at Bondi Junction. But, but uh, tell us about the, the shopping centre because it's closed now, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, Westfield Bondi is it's on the books at 3.9 billion, so it's the 3.2 billion. So it's the third most valuable shopping centre in Australia after Chadston at six point. Three, I think it is, and Westfield Sydney Centre CBD at three point nine. It's got four hundred and forty-five tenants. It has seventeen point seven annual million annual visitors and sales of uh, of one point two billion. So I used to when I was living in Sydney, I used to go there all the time. Yeah, and it's it's a vertical shopping centre, so it's like you know five or six stories. Mm. And I reckon Westfield Centre Group is going to come under a lot of pressure to improve and increase their security. You can't well, not just, just have in that place. It have to be that would have to apply to all shopping centres now. Yeah. Surely, yeah. Um, they can't just have uh, some uh, refugee run, wandering around as uh, yeah. unarmed as yeah. the security Correct. person. Correct, and because it's a multi-level, like this guy was able to duck up and down escalators, and like it's not a big sort of open thing. Um, and look, there, the Centre Group AGM was last week, uh, or, uh, and it was a real two-hour grilling, like, you know, mainly on, you know, your shopping centre values and, and how you perform it. I do think they're going to come under a lot of pressure. And, they, and it will, I think it'll affect their sales a little bit too, because a lot of people are going to be a bit awkward, a bit, you know, I'll just order online rather yeah. than... Um, uh, I think you know. there's something in that. Yeah. And um, then, like, staying with Sydney, I mean, obviously you've got the... You got the Bruce Lamb and you know defamation trial of the century, where um, geez, I mean, it just bodies everywhere in terms of uh, reputational damage. That's for sure. It's hard to think of um, a more of a corporate thing there. I mean, it was interesting that Mark Llewellyn, the producer of Spotlight, executive producer of Spotlight, quietly got sacked at yeah. the same time. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> right. Mean, well, I think I mean Kerry Stokes is furious, but at the end of the day, you know, he is responsible for the culture. He, he controls 40% of the votes. The stock is down to 18 and a half cents. Uh, there's a board meeting today at, on Thursday for Seven West Media. So I do think there's a question of, is Stokes going to hang in there? I mean, his reputation has been damaged for the behaviour of, of Spotlight. Ten's reputation, you know, the journalistically, they went with the political cover-up angle when the judge is saying no there wasn't a political there was a rape but there wasn't a, a political conspiracy so basically this trial has just become one giant <laughs> political media and legal imbroglio and um, well as he put it an omni shambles omni, omni shambles and uh, i mean as a news corp shareholder i'm outraged that they settled with bruce lerman and gave him two hundred ninety five thousand dollars, and then effectively backed him you know through the australian like backed him all the way and uh, so that News Corp's looking silly. Seven's looking silly. Ten's had a win, but a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. Um, who's going to fund the $10 million case? Is there going to be an appeal? And, you know, there's another defamation case to go with um, Linda Reynolds suing Brittany Higgins and David Shiraz in Perth. So, you know, round 27. Here we go. Yeah. Um, and still on Sydney, Star Entertainment. What's going on there? Oh, look. Our fellow, fellow Money Cafe prognosticator, James Thompson, had a wonderful column in the Fin Review yesterday. So the first day of the latest government inquiry into Star, and turns out that uh, the, the, the chair and CEO were sort of spying on the government-appointed regulator, this Nick is, Weeks, this the this special the, manager. These are the new... The new... Uh, the, the, new bo- the, the new broom. 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 The new it's broom, <laughs> spying on the guy and and then bulk approving high-risk customers. So, you know, these colourful money, money launderers or, you know, VIPs from, you know, like just bulk approving as opposed to the, the new know your customer regime. Like, hey, mate, where'd you get your Ferrari from? How are you worth 50 million? Are you a drug dealer or not? So bulk approving them and then the whole welfare check with pokies addicts like 
just making it up. You know, yeah, we tapped this person on the shoulder and said, you've been going nonstop for three and a half hours. Under our new rules, we've got to check if you're okay after three hours. Are you okay, mate? Do you need a break? Just faking it. Like, just making up the numbers. So, I think that the current people involved in that, including the current um, senior leadership at the board level, I don't think they'll be there for very long. So who's the who's the guy who's well, the Robbie people who, Cook, who, are the, who are they? Well, Robbie Cook is the CEO who's already announced his resignation but hasn't really said why. So he's out. But he's the only bloke who's been the CEO of four public companies, What If, Tats, Tyro and Star. And David Foster is the current executive chair because he lost his CEO a few weeks ago and he's the former CEO of Suncor and the current director of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. So the rest of the directors, there's all sorts of very well-credentialed new clean skin directors, a former head of institutional banking at NAB. So do they all have to go? Well, I don't know. I, I think what will happen here is, as usual, the board will have no idea. The non-executive directors will sit there and go, oh, nobody told us. So the people, and it's basically the chair and CEO of the ones being named, who were conspiring to spy on the special manager, launch a class action and legal action against the government and ultimately responsible for some of the um, questionable uh, reporting under the new regime, uh, they won't be there for very long. But does Star itself now get sacked well, as a uh, well, casino operator? I mean, do they do they lose their licence? Well, I mean, they effectively they've, they've been on probation and now there's a greater risk they lose their licence. But, I mean, I still don't accept that they can actually – cancel a casino licence. I mean, look, I know that gambling is Why basically... Not? Well, gambling, I know, is basically state-sponsored abuse, where the government says, says we give you, give you a licence to, you know, rip off addicts and help money launderers. That's effectively the Australian story of $25 billion a year in gambling losses. And um, so they can't shut the casino down. No, no, but, but you know, the Star Entertainment, the company, can lose its licence and the licence has to go to somebody else. Yeah, but look... I mean, who, who would buy it? The stock is at 48 cents. So the market cap is now $1.44 billion. And they've done two raisings over the last year, raising $1.55 billion. So what should have happened a year ago or 15 months ago, they should have handed back the keys to the government and said, look, we're done. You're, you're going to put the taxes up. You're going to make our business untenable. Here are the keys. Instead, they went to their investors and did two raisings, $800 million and $750 million, raised $1.55 billion for a company that was effectively broke. And that money's just been smoked because the whole company's now only worth one44 And so there is an issue from my point of view with the government being too harsh. The 70,000 retail shareholders out there doing their shirts. It's a casino. Um, but the hubris of thinking they could pull the wool over the government-appointed monitor was just extraordinary. And um, why aren't they ripping into the pubs and clubs in New South Wales, which is where the, most of the worst practices happen, not just at the, 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 the casino at Piermont? Yes, absolutely. So um, there you go. We've done the rounds of, of, of wild times in Sydney. What about wild times on the markets with uh, Israel and US interest rates and VIX index going up or the vapour rug... Index, as you called on the news last night. Explain that one to me. Well, you know, don't you, you haven't you used put Vix vapor up on your children? <laughs> <laughs> I had. Yes. I can't. I, I look. It's probably a, it's a very silly thing, but um, yeah, Vix the Vix index. I always think of Vix vapor up when I think when I see the Vix yes. Vix index. You're breaching the um, uh, the uh, plugging uh, brands and products on the ABC with that joke. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Such a bore. Sorry, Al. Uh, but the VIX is rising because of global tensions, obviously. Well, yeah, but it's, uh, as I pointed out last night, it's nowhere near as high as it was uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, and it's it's still relatively low. And I think that the interesting thing about the Iran attack on Israel is that they fired hundreds of rockets, including ballistic missiles, towards Israel, and all but one or two of them got shot down. Yeah. And it used to, I mean, the thing is that uh, I don't think anyone really knew that that was they were capable of doing that. Yeah, they've kept this this uh, capability secret, um, you know. But uh, because and everyone has previously thought that you can't really uh, shoot a bullet with a bullet, which is what they're doing. And mm. uh, but they they can mm. and they did. The Iron Dome is extraordinary, uh, uh, but also the the um, 
the the people who were involved in doing it was not wasn't just Israel. It was the US, UK, uh, and a bit of France, and a bit of France and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, so the actual cost, basically, no casualties. The cost I read somewhere was one point three billion in fuel. So I bet the Saudis will just put a bit of oil in and put a bit of fuel in, and yeah. uh, you put you know all these uh, hundreds so, uh, of planes in the air and shoot down all these drones. So uh, look, I think that, that I think warfare changed over the weekend. I think it was really interesting. It was, it was amazing, wasn't it? So, uh, but look, the markets are a bit skittish. So we will have our fourth drop today on the All Lords in a row. But you're saying it's more, you know. US inflation, surging US retail trade figures, worries about the Fed and interest rates Well, look, driving it, the markets down rather than Israel. At the moment. I mean, look, obviously things change if Israel attacks Iran now. Mm. That that would change things. I mean, I, but, but for the moment, geopolitics are not really the main thing. It's really still about what's going to happen to US interest rates, um, uh, what happened last week after the um, the March uh, the March CPI came out in the US was that uh, the the consensus view about uh, rates cuts in the US went from three back to one to two mm. this year. Um, the, you know there had been forecasted there'd be three rate cuts this year in the US, but now it looks like one or two uh, at the most, maybe none. Um, you know, and, it, and nothing's changed in Australia really. So um, yeah. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, I'm surprised the markets are so strong. With all this stuff going on, you know, I just think that this sort of boom in the market going up. And and I, I think we should mention the takeover boom as well. You know, there's now been 54, $250 million plus takeovers announced or completed since 2019. And we've had five completed so far this year and another 17 in the works. So it's a record. I've never seen this. It's now been 14 months in a row. So what, what's this, why is this happening, do you think? Oh, I just think that private equity, super funds, um, the desire for institutional investors with short-termism to cash out um, and... So cheap do, money, uh, easy, uh, easy, cheap money. Of the, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of the takeovers from private equity, or is oh, it private oh. equity selling out, or both? Oh, look, it's look, it's the it's the it's the full range. So, I mean, let's go through them. So, Costa Group, you know, Australia's biggest horticulture, got bought by U.S. private equity, and the big berry company, the old Cab Charge, got bought by a Singaporean company. Boat Lungier went to U.S. Uh, private equity. Volpara Health, which is a Wellington-based, listed on the ASX, they got snapped up by a South Korean company in, with AI and breast cancer. That was a sort of an AI tech play. Link Group, the share registry, is going to be bought by the Japanese giant Mitsubishi. We're voting next week. Pact Group's been privatised by the, the Pratt family. Borrell's being snapped up by Kerry Stokes. Adelaide Brighton, the concrete company, is being bought by a competitor Barrow Group, teaming up with an Irish giant. Altium, $9 billion in cash from a Japanese chip maker. Illumina, the US parent, um, MMA Offshore, it's just a, 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 you know, a, a foreign rival bidder at 260. Virgin Money, 5.6 billion. Uh, that's just a, the, the, the uh, rival nationwide in the US. And um, then the ones that haven't completed that might Southern Cross Media, APM Human Services and Austal have all been subject to bids. So, and meanwhile, there's no floats. No floats. No major floats. So we've had 14 months in a row of reduction in number of listings on the ASX, a drop of uh, 120, and it'll be 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, because all these deals are going to complete progressively over the year, and I cannot see any major new floats on the horizon. So the ASX is thinning out. Popular stocks are getting toppy, like Commonwealth Bank. You can only buy so many Commonwealth Bank and CSL and Macquarie shares, and there's not enough it? new stocks coming on. Yeah, that's the and Stokes, I mean, I want to ask you about Kerry Stokes and Borrell. When someone says that this takeover offer is my final and best offer, what does that mean, do you think? <laughs> what does that mean? Does that mean that... Well, but isn't there a legal obligation that if you say that, that's yeah, it, that yeah, is it? Yeah, unless you suddenly increase a dividend. So on Friday, Kerry Stokes comes out with a 26 cent fully frank special dividend and the director's rolled. So that's how you get around... This is my final oh, and best offer. Right. And then he's also done a $300 million buyback. 
But the problem Kerry Stokes has got is how do you get 51,000 sleepy retail shareholders who often don't open the mail or read their emails to accept your on-market offer or to accept your marker, which is not a scheme of arrangement where the big boys vote to sell you out. This is actually a direct offer. Right. And Borrell's only gone from so he needs- 70,000 to 50,000 as Stokes has gone from zero to 80%. But he needs 90. He needs 90%. So how's he going to get there? He's just got to keep sending sweet postcards to us retail shareholders. I'll throw all of his postcards in the bin. I'm not selling to him. And, um, and then he's going to try and do an on-market buyback to, you know, jawbone his way to, to well, 90% and then compulsorily acquire the rest and uh, roll borrow into seven group. Obviously what's going to happen, Stephen, is you're going to answer the phone one day and it'll be Kerry on the phone. Oh, that's right. Saying, Stephen, <laughs> please sell me your shares. Yes, that's right. So... <laughs> Well, look, Kerry, Kerry is a bit creepy, right? He's the master of creeping up share indices. He never completes a takeover. Oh, so creep- this will be oh that's his, sort of creepy. Yeah, he's a, creepy he's, a creepy, he's a creepy guy. He gets control you by don't, You're creepy. not saying he's creepy. He's a no, creep. No, no. Well, I, I, I think about the, the culture at Seven's a bit ordinary. But how's this for a stat? Seven Group, his parent company, which is, you know, Borrell, West Track, Oil and Gas, Coates Hire, it's now 50 times as valuable as Seven West Media. So Seven Group's worth... 15 billion and Channel 7's struggling for 300. Yes, well, you'd rather. So he should re- mop that up. You'd rather invest in earth moving than media, wouldn't you? Yeah, TV. That's, that's right. Let's face it. That's right. But uh, anyway, look, before we get to questions, I think we should note that uh, shortly in Canberra, so when people are listening to this, it probably will have all happened, but Brad Banducci, the CEO of Woolworths, how long do you think the senators have allocated for his appearance in Canberra at the Senate inquiry into supermarkets today? How long would you ask to, to, to have a chat to Brad, Brad Banducci for? Three, to, three months. <laughs> no. He's got three hours. Three hours. Three hours. So it's going to be... A Spanish Inquisition. I think it's going to be feral. If the senators know one thing, and we saw it with Qantas, we've seen it with quite a few, is they do know how to do a bipartisan, hung, drawn, and quartered uh, cross examination. So I do believe that Brad Banducci um, has resigned. So he probably won't give a flying. He's just going to say, "Well, I'm out. I've got my 20, 30 mil." Um, the new incoming uh, female CEO can uh, pick up the pieces. And then how long have they given Leah Weckett, the Coles how CEO, long? this afternoon? Well, it's equal opportunity abuse, isn't it? Three, Three hours. hours. Three so hours. All over the papers tomorrow, if you can squeeze it in amongst the terrorism and the, the mass killings and all the other chaos in the world, you well, will it'll see. De- it'll depend on what they say, obviously. I mean... Yeah. Um, well, a little solution. Oh, be, no, their, their job is to get through the three hours without saying anything, right? Yeah, yeah. But I don't think it'll be possible to. I think they're gonna they're gonna have to voluntarily cut prices to save their bacon going forward, and they have the power to reduce their profit margins. If I was one of them, I would make a short-term decision to actually reduce your profit margins and try and provide some value, particularly on essentials like fresh food, to head off the regulatory attack that will come if they continue to make super profits in a cost of living crisis. And the one thing I'd love to see them do is a, is a forced register of every property they own, because I do agree with Metcash that they game the system by buying up competitor sites and then evicting them from the centre. You know, I mean, like Leo's, magnificent super independent player in um, in Melbourne, you know, where does where does Woolworths build their flashest new Woolworths in Melbourne? In Heidelberg, 300 metres from Leo's. They, they spend, you know, tens of millions building the nicest. Is that right? Yeah. And, uh, and I know that's hurt Leo's by more than 10% of sales. I mean, like... So it's that sort of tactic of buying up I, right near... I didn't know there was a Leo's in Heidelberg. There's a Leo's in Heidelberg. Right. And just down the road, there is the most magnificent new Woolworths. Um, and it's that sort of tactic and then the all the sort of the, the property buys to yeah, evict the Surely that comes under all's fair in love and war. You're not going to... Yeah, I mean... Yeah. But, but all I'm saying for is public transparency of the properties that you own. So when they do buy up you know, all the key land around to, to stop someone from opening against them, you can see that Coles have just bought this, Woolies just bought that because that's part of their power is they can use their balance sheets to secretly trade properties and supermarkets, it's a, it's a politics of property and a, a, a market power game and you need the planning system and understand the planning rules and, and that's how they do it, their control of property. 
Before we move to questions, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Is it time to brush up on your investing skills and knowledge? Well, InvestSmart's Investor Bootcamp is for you. Learn the fundamentals of investing, how to form better money habits, and what it takes to build long-term wealth. Do it at your own pace over three months with the option to participate in live weekly webinars to consolidate your learning. Usually $99, Money Cafe listeners can get $40 off with the code MONEY40. Visit investsmart.com.au forward slash bootcamp and use money40 to save $40. Okay, first question is from Richard. Um, quick question. If I buy 100 shares at a dollar, then another batch of 100 shares at $2, then sell 100 dollars, 100 shares for $1.50, is that a capital gain or a loss? How does the timing work for the gain or loss? Well, Richard, the, the simple thing is you have to nominate – which shares you are selling. So if you've bought shares over 10 years, when you sell the shares, you have to say, the 100 shares I'm selling today, it's this 100 shares that I paid a a dollar for. You you can actually decide because there's no identifier on different parcels of shares. So if you're clever, you never sell shares with a capital gain in less than 12 months of ownership because you won't get the 50% capital gains discount. Uh, Now, I'm reading all the questions this week because... Uh, We had a slight... um, Snafu on the printing. Bit of a snafu on the printing, but never mind. Tristan says, can you time your super contributions for the best market conditions? Or does your super fund just invest when it decides? Um, For example, ignoring all taxation questions, could you potentially make a once-off voluntary contribution when the stock market falls to try and take advantage via super? And the answer is yes, you can, Tristan, because basically what you're doing is you're uh, buying units in a fund. Uh, and the unit prices go up and down. Correct. So if you think, for instance, that your super fund is over-invested in unlisted assets and some crash happens or there's some you know, major 20% correction, then it might be actually clever to cash out of your super in that fund and move to something more liquid because uh, – Things that are liquid and trade every day can be valued every day, the unit pricing. But if a fund has got, you know, $10 billion in an unlisted airport, then the whole question of the timing of the valuations of those assets to determine the unit pricing is a factor. But a good a good general rule is cash out your super at the very top of the boom and put as much into your super when markets are in a great world of pain. Sure. Karen says, in the interest of raising the percentage of females who write into your podcast, please accept my missive. Will do, Karen. Oh dear, Max, check your misogyny, mate, and also your unconscious bias. Why don't women drive Ubers and cabs? Let me think. Could it be a safety issue? Why don't women work in male-dominated industries? Gee, I don't know. Maybe it's the misogyny they'll have to put up with day in, day out. Uh, And then she tells the story of when she was an 18-year-old, wanted to be an architect, and was, uh, you know, subject to misogynistic comments and didn't. So, uh, I regret I lacked the courage to forge ahead in the face of such misogyny. I wonder how you would have coped, Max, had the boot been on the other foot. With thanks for your terrific podcast. No question there, but I thought it'd be... Oh, hang on. Oh, no, this is from CC, another Yeah, well, person. I mean, so, look. I agree with Karen. There is a lot of misogyny out there. There's a lot of unconscious bias out there, but there's also been some progress. I mean, I caught up with my 22-year-old... Uh, daughter the other day, a deputy mayor of Manningham, and she's got a black eye. She's got quite a black eye because she's in the ruck uh, in football. And 10 or 15 years ago, people were saying that playing AFL football was a man's thing and women shouldn't play. And now there are tens of thousands of people playing all those traditional male sports and working in more professions. Lots of them are driving trucks for Gina Reinhardt on her giant iron ore mine. So a long way to go but there has been some progress. And, of course, your daughter is in the ruck. (laughs) (laughs) She's not only tall like me, but she's actually strong. So she's a very formidable ruck, Laura Main. CC says, uh, one, two questions. One, what's your take on the likelihood of Mr Donald Trump being re-elected in 2024 and what will be the effect on global markets and politics? Uh, I don't think – well, look, who knows? But I don't think he will be elected. I just can't believe that Americans will do that. Um, I know he's ahead in the polls, but really, surely not. We all said that about Tony Abbott. We all said that about Brexit. We all said that about Donald Trump the first time. 
I think there's a chance that he'll get elected. I think generally that his bark will be worse than his bite when he's actually in power and that the institutions, the checks and balances in America will stop some of the wildest scenarios from happening. But, you know, the worst case scenario is obviously, you know, a major war in Europe with America sitting it out, you know, with, with Putin on the march, Ukraine falling and then Russia and, and Trump being an isolationist. Yeah, I know. That is a debacle if it happens, but I don't think that the Republican Party would. I think he'd just get rolled if he tried to do that. Last time he got elected and he gave billionaires a massive tax cut and markets soared. At the end of the day, he delivered for the big end of town, the billionaires, more than anyone with that massive tax cut. And I think ultimately he'll continue to rule for the billionaires while he appeals to the patriots and the supremacists. Uh, question two is, uh, is the high rate of divorce and separation having a negative impact on housing availability? I.e. mum and dad divorce, sell the family home and buy two new homes. Um, uh, well, you're, you've uh, resulted in... Uh, 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 I don't know about that, Alan. Um, no. I don't think. I mean, divorce has always been at forty percent, hasn't it? It's uh, is it really no, gone I up? I don't think it's an issue. Um, no, I agree. I think that, um, and also you've got more just cost of living. You've got more multi generational households. More, you know, grandparents helping out with the, the caring. You've got a lot more parents buying properties for their kids to help them into the housing market. Um, but no, I don't think that uh, that's a factor. Ben says, my wife and I recently purchased a new home. We're now buying furniture uh, when we have the savings to do so. We found that the strategy that works for us is to go into our local Harvey Norman to see and tr- uh, to see and try out which product we want to go with, ask for the best price, and then look online and call the competitors to get a better deal. We found Harvey Norman has the largest range on the floor, best sales team with experience and knowledge of the products, but never the best price. My work colleagues tell me they do the same thing. I don't shed a tear for Jerry Harvey, but my last trip to Harvey Norman to buy a bed, I generally felt sorry for the sales attendant who was extremely helpful, worked hard to sell us the products, um, and we ended up buying it much cheaper online. Uh, do you think there's a future for large format retail stores like stores like Harvey Norman? Um, I think they've probably got a problem. Sure. Well, I've got a, a problem, but at the end of the day, I remember at, at the Centre Group AGM, Last week, um, you know, David Kingston, the, the shareholder activist, rich lister guy, was ripping into the board. I was asking a few questions and this, this, this guy gets up and says, just leave the board alone. We own a lot of property in Sydney. Property always goes up. Stop whinging, never sell property and we'll go well. And I actually agree with that. So Harvey Norman has a very large and valuable multi-billion dollar property portfolio. If there was some absolute disaster, that could all be, you know, converted into housing or whatever. So a lot of businesses yeah, are yeah. a business, but the property underpinnings of the business oh, yes. is where the value is. And I think Harvey Norman is in that category. No, but they've still got to sell beds. Well, they, yeah, they, they do. Sell, they yes, have to sell They JB have to sell Hi-Fi stuff. Hi-Fi does not own any of their stores. And they used to be able to gloat that they had the lowest rent to sales ratio of 2% because they were always not in Westfield. Harvey Norman, you will not find any of them in Westfield because Jerry thinks that they just rip them off. And so they always own their own property, slightly off the beaten track. So that is their business model. They're basically a property owner. They're like Brickworks. More value in property, in owning brick manufacturing sites than actually selling bricks. And, uh, and Jerry's got a few other sneaky tactics. You know why they don't pay any payroll tax? Harvey Norman? How does Harvey Norman pay subtle payroll tax, whereas JB, J, JB Hi-Fi is paying, you know, 10 or 15 million a year? Franchise model. Oh, I see. Some people call them fake franchises because the bank account gets sweet. No, but the, the, franchise, the franchisees have staff, don't they? Yeah, but they, a lot of it is under the uh, payroll tax threshold. So oh. if you can have enough legal franchises that are a illegally separate entity, you will save yourself $25 million a year in payroll tax, which is the number. If Harvey Norman was running like JB Hi-Fi and they were just a regular consolidated national business, the payroll tax bill would be $25 million or so a year higher. So look, there's problems with the model, but Jerry's a billionaire. He's got a lot of property. They're not going broke anytime soon. Anthony says, what at what VIX or AVIX, uh, ASX VIX, do we consider low, normal, and high volatility for their respective markets? Uh, well, you're the VIX va- vapor rub expert, Alan. What do you, I mean? Is how does the Aussie VIX work? I just well, thought it was a global VIX. No, it's, it's the VIX. The VIX is um, uh, 
a ton from options, from the options market. And I don't know how they do it exactly, but it's taken off, uh, it's taken, it, it measures volatility using options. So I, I, as I say, I don't know how they do it, but that's that's what happens. And likewise in Australia, the, um, the options market, I mean, as to what the level is, uh, I don't know, have a look at a, have a look at a, a, um, a chart of it, Anthony. I mean, where is it? Hang on, I'll just call up a chart of the VIX. Here we go. And uh, when it was high, when it was high in 2020, when the COVID hit, the VIX index got to 75. And it's currently, six, uh, currently 19, which is up a bit from where it was which was, it's just, a, this is just an index, so it was 11. So when, when the VIX is 11 or 10, it, it's not volatile. There's no volatility at all, mm. or hardly any. Mm. Um, so when it gets up to 20, it's starting to get a bit volatile. When Russia invaded Japan, the VIX, VIX index got to 30. Sorry, when Russia invaded Ukraine, did mm. I say Japan? <laughs> <laughs> when Russia invaded Ukraine, <laughs> it got up to 30. That was quite volatile. Yeah, and so basically it is a very important in- indicator, and yeah. our local one and the international one. Now, despite Alan our printing snafu, I do have one question. So Stephen from Manningham has a question for Alan. Should Richard Goida survive as the chairman of Woodside at next year, next week's annual meeting in Perth, but he's given, such a, given the Qantas snafu? But he's such a nice man. He is the nicest CEO the nicest and chairman that Australia's ever produced. It's just you want to give him a cuddle. He's so nice. He's so nice. But he's not. He's quite good at hiring aggressive people like Meg O'Neill, straight out of Exxon Mobil there in Texas. I mean, she is a hard, tough, oil CEO, and Richard's this cuddly bear chair who everyone loves. And so that's that was a great strategy for West Farmers and Coles. You know, don't accuse them of market power because. The, ch- the, the CEO is such a nice man. So anyway, I think Richard Goyder should be sacked as Woodside Chair next week for his various snafus. Did nothing about gambling at the AFL. Uh, refuses to cancel political donations at Woodside. But mainly it's just a Qantas question. I mean, you can't have a disaster at Qantas and you get sacked at Qantas and then you can keep going at another ASX20 company. Shouldn't you be out? If you're sacked for a major blunder at a public company, shouldn't that be the end of your professional chairing career? Don't you think you can... You, CVs do matter, Alan. Do, do CVs matter? If your CV has a major blot on the copybook, can you just turn up at that AGM and say, this is a Woodside shareholder meeting, we're not here to talk about Qantas. Whenever someone says that, I, the AGM I say, so you're saying CVs don't matter, are you? Because they do. <laughs> <laughs> How are you voting your shares? I voted my nine against Richard Gordon. Actually. What do you reckon? Too nice? He's a mate of yours? I, I wouldn't call him a mate, no. Just I, a very pleasant I, man. He's a pleasant man. <laughs> Aidan says, thanks for everything you do. I just have a cheeky question. How much of your reasoning behind why interest rates are too high and should be cut is because your children have mortgages? Do you think this opinion is biased or do you have other anchoring evidence thoughts as to why rates should be lower? It's entirely because of that... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We all I mean, talk about kids. Book. My we kids come around and book. whinge to me every day. I'm like, oh, crikey, I've got to shut them up. No, no. Back uh, at mum and dad. Yeah, we no, all took up. I'm entirely book. unbiased. My my opinions on interest rates are uh, my opinions that are not yeah. based on anything other than that. So. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I we, we're all driven by that, but you're just seeing a lot of pain out there, and. So I agree. They're too high and they should be cut. Yeah, now. they should be and will now. be. Now. Cut them now. Uh, Lucinda talks about also the quarterly essay on housing. Loved it. A question on the psychology of first-home buyers. Uh, why do people buy the most expensive house or apartment for which they can get finance? For example, I could have bought a two-bedroom apartment in Lakemba for 400000 Instead, I spent more than twice as much to get a two-bedroom apartment in Redfern. Shouldn't a rational economic player minimise their lifetime interest payments and buy the cheapest bearable housing? It's called well, keeping up with the Joneses. Well, yeah, and and living the I've lifestyle always, that you wish to become accustomed to. I've always bought the most expensive house I can afford. Yeah. Uh, well, everyone lives. Is, to, people live to their income, and that includes buying the most expensive house you can afford. I, yeah, and I, I've, that's always worked for me. I don't know. So yeah, I think you should buy the most expensive house you can afford. That's what I tell my children. 
Well, I went over the top when I was 24 and committed to a $340,000 three-bedroom apartment in East Melbourne and couldn't uh, come up with the settlement and got bailed out by my dad. There so you go. So I overreached. I had to leave Jeff Kennett's employment yeah. and go back to the Herald Sun as a business editor just to get a pay rise and still the bank said my ratios were no good and dad had to bail me out. So you're right, people just go over the top with so the their Herald, houses. So the Herald Sun paid you more than Jeff did? Yeah, I, got a, I went from 55000 to 65000 So I had to leave Jeff because of the, the well, I was going to lose my deposit. Oh, is that right? That's, that's, why you, that's why I left. That's yeah. why you left. Well, Evans. Kenneth wouldn't give me a pay rise. You heard it here first, if folks. If Kenneth had given me a pay rise, I'd never have left him, never gone on Four Corners, and the world could have been different. And you... <laughs> <laughs> anyway. And you'd be working for John Pursuto now? No, I'd be an MP. I'd be a Liberal MP. Oh, you would, of course. Well, I've been a, you know... You'd be a Liberal MP. I was MP. a Liberal staffer, you know, that, that sort of whole thing. Much better being a... And you'd be... a suburban councillor with, you know, no profile. Who'd want to work for that party anyway? <laughs> You'd be Premier. Oh, yes. Not likely. You'd be Reserve Bank Governor. <laughs> um, right, a couple more. A couple more. Um, Paul says, uh, love the show. As someone from the UK, I'm astonished that you still need a 20% deposit. It should be 5 to 10% and banks should self-insure to cover the extremely low risk involved to lend 90%. The current insurance system is ridiculous and completely out of touch with reality. Why is no one talking about this? I, I actually agree with that. That You see the, the credit rating, the S&P upgraded all of our big banks last week, the credit rating, and they said it's because we've got the best regulatory system in the world or something like that. And you know what they're referring to? They're referring to the fact that it's bloody, they, it's bloody tough on the banks to be reckless lenders. They have to insure all their home loan book. They never lend more than like 70%. And they never lose any money. There's no such thing as a bad debt write-off in the mortgage market for our big banks. I mean, have you ever heard of a bank actually losing money on a residential loan? Why do they insure? It's yeah. just money for jam for the insurers and it puts up the cost of a mortgage. Yeah. Great observations from our English friend. Yes. Um, well, uh, what else? One more question. Well, I was going to throw in one little – I'll take this one as a comment. So – Retail shareholders getting ripped off in capital raisings, Alan. It's getting worse. So Next DC has just done a $1.32 billion capital raising and it's a non-renounceable. And so the 35,000 retail shareholders, the majority of them will not take it up because it's non-renounceable and they will be diluted without compensation. And the statistic I'm going to give you to prove that retail shareholders don't act in their best interests, don't open the mail because everything's gone online, is Orica recently had a share purchase plan that was comfortably in the money. They sent it to all 35,000 shareholders and only 5,700 took it up. That's 16.3%. So 84% of Orica's retail shareholders acted irrationally and did not take up an in-the-money offer. So the message to the market is the biggest victims in Australia's capital raising system is the retail shareholder who does nothing. So never do a non-renounceable capital raising. Always make it renounceable so their shares are sold off if they don't take it up and they are compensated for their property rights. And Next DC is the latest that should have done a Patreo, instead did a non-renounceable and tens of thousands of retail shareholders will be diluted without compensation because of their own incompetence and communication snafus where a lot of shareholders don't even know there is an in-the-money offer in their email inbox with their accountant, with their super fund or whatever third party player is mismanaging the interests of their retail shareholder clients. Yeah, I'd suggest... Oh, and um, Greg's put up a little sign saying, please keep your questions short because a lot of questions were cut out this week um, simply because they're too long um, and we just can't do it in the time available. So keep your questions short, please. Do you know a lot of podcasts, like The Rest Is Politics, they have a separate question time podcast. So they do an hour and then they do a separate half an hour just for questions. So we're actually not common they, in combining them. I'm not asking you to double your work rate and they, do two do a they week. they chat for an hour, do they? Yeah. So that is the well, more. I you mean, look at the rest of entertainment, you look at Pivot, a lot of them have question time separate from um, – and we're getting so many questions, I reckon there might just be a case for that at some point, Alan. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening to today's Money Cafe. I'll be back next week with – James Thompson, send in your questions to the Money Cafe at EurekaReport.com.au. Keep them short. Till then, I'm Alan Kohler, founder of Eureka Report, etc. 
And I'm Stephen Main, one of Alan's contributors at Intelligent Investor. 